Hello, I'm Alex Rittman, and thank you very much for joining us for, for the Hollywood Reporter Presents Q&A with some of the key creative forces behind the phenomenal BBC Amazon anthology film series Small Axe, including co-writer, director, executive producer and co-editor Steve McQueen, associate producer and lead researcher Helen Bart, uh, production designer Helen Scott and costume designer on the Lovers Rock and Alex Wheatle films Jacqueline Duran. Firstly, congratulations to you all on a truly spectacular, fascinating, often painful and regularly uplifting series of films, unlike anything I think we've seen on TV before, and something that really does deserve every accolade that's come its way so far. And speaking of accolades, congratulations on the five BAFTA TV Craft Awards that you just picked up, including for you, Helen Jacqueline, for production costume design. I'd love to, um, I'd love to hear where the idea for Small Axe first began. I understand it was actually being discussed back in 2010. You know, what was the original kernel of the idea back then? Well, it was a sort of, um, a, sort of a want, a must, and a need, really. It was a, um, things which I had... Um, wanted to see on TV, wanted to see on, on big screen, hadn't been. And in some ways, what it was, was an attempt to sort of fix the canon of, of British cinema, or at least fix the narrative, because certain important things had been, are missing from that narrative. Um, and it was about looking back at, at a time and, and looking at where we've come to and where, where we've come from, in a way. Um, and it was a situation where the clock was ticking, people were, 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 were passing and these stories needed to be told. So it was a sort of a, a need. Yes, it took 11 years for it to come to the screen. That's just because of a certain sense of, you know, having, a, having to mature, having to have a certain kind of, um, how can I say, a, a certain kind of um, weaponry as such in order to deal with all this stuff. And I, I didn't have it then. And uh, as, as I sort of, as I went along with the research and we met, I met Helen and uh, Tracy Scofield and others, uh, then I sort of, things seemed to sort of uh, gather, and it were, as it were. And, it, and what, I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is during that time, I had to sort of get myself ready. I prepare myself mm -hmm. because I didn't have the skills that, that, that I did now. And I think that was just about looking back. And sometimes looking back could be painful. And you sort of you look back and you see things differently, similar to how you see your parents when you're a young person, as opposed to when you see them, you know, when you're older. And, um, and Helen Barr, I think I read that while Steve went off to make a, couple of films that you know largely went unnoticed in shame mm. and 12 years a slave <laughs> uh, you were conducting more than 120 interviews to uncover stories that could be used for this yeah I, I actually started probably after 12 years a slave actually I started so Stephen Tracy and Dave might have been there from 2010 I sort of joined 2014 um, mm. and and obviously one of the reasons I really wanted to be part of this is because I, I'd left my job and I you know I wanted to do something that I could really get stuck into and um, I was very fortunate to meet Tracy and Dave and they introduced me to Steve and we, we clicked um, and um, one of the great things about it was that Steve was very generous in sort of giving me an open brief I mean he was very firm about what he wanted to achieve from it so you know I knew I had that marker of 1968 you know Enoch Powell rivers of blood um, you know the birth of sort of black activism from the sort of the second generation, sort of 1968, I knew there was lots within that. And I knew from just having read bits that um, the mangrove story, I didn't know a vast amount about the mangrove at that stage, but I, I had read up and I knew that was something that we had to cover. But essentially I knew it was about my, my own community, mine and Steve's community, and I knew that I would know a lot of these characters. And I had also met several people during my time as a reporter. I'd been a reporter for many years beforehand. So I had quite a good contacts list, but through interviewing people, they gave me many names and I checked them all out. And, you know, one of the, the main things I decided very early on in was that people needed to trust me. So I was very clear that they could, you know, I gave my home number, my home email. Um, I said, they could, I, I used to hand out cards with all my home details on and I said, you call me anytime if you have stories, if you'd like to talk to me. And people did do that. So I was very fortunate and that sort of started the, the ball rolling and naturally one interview would lead to another. And then it became addictive and I was pounding <laughs> the streets of Notting Hill, <laughs> grabbing people <laughs> off the street, no. But I mean, it was literally, people were like, you know, coming to me and then, then it became, once we started, you know, Tracy, Steve and Dave started sort of honing down exactly what they wanted. Then I was a lot more targeted about 
the kind of people that I was then going to meet and interview. And that meant sort of tracking down, you know, surviving members of the Mangrove Nine and, and vice versa. Um, you know, then, you know, striking gold with people like Leroy Logan, who I'd known for many years. And I interviewed him and Steve liked his story. So it was a um, various layers. And, and, and it also involved doing a lot of desk research to sort of back up some of the stories and to sort of corroborate and, and, and have evidence for the stories a lot of people were telling me. And of course, all the evidence was there. And did you get an immediate sense that you were talking to many people whose stories hadn't ever really been told or received the sort yeah. of recognition they deserved? Well, well, both, yeah, hadn't been told and and not really received the recognition. I mean, you know, the thing about saying you're doing a, a project working with Steve McQueen is that it does open doors and there is this element of trust. I mean, I think absolutely no disrespect to any other filmmaker, but I think the fact that Steve has had at this stage an extremely high profile and, and black people, certainly in London where I'm from, were incredibly proud of him and what he'd done, what he'd achieved. People were willing to talk to me. I mean, that's not to say, you know, I didn't receive some sort of pushback and there was some sort of opposition to, to what I was doing and hostility, because obviously these are stories that are protected within a very tight community of Labrick Grove. And there was this need to know that they were going to be treated right and they were going to be, you know, treated with respect, which I think Steve has done beautifully and, and the rest of the team, obviously. Um, and, um, you know, so there was a little, you know, there was a little bit of pushback. That's not to say there wasn't, but on the whole, people were willing to speak. And I, I felt that it was important not just to speak to, to people whose names are well known, but to speak to people who are on the periphery as well. And so I would speak to, to former drug pushers who used to, to walk down All Saints Road, you know, selling dope or, you know, or, you know, anyone that could give me a good anecdote. There were lots of people who had anecdotes about PC Pulley. I mm. spoke to lots of policemen as well, um, who again were very protective of the way they policed back in the day and, um, and understandably still quite clannish about their methods. But the fact was they spoke to me and, and, and in some regards that really helped for when we did get to, to meet, Steve and I eventually did get to meet Althea Jones Laquant and her husband, Eddie. I had several conversations with Roden Gordon on the phone, although we didn't actually meet, but we, you know, we met, um, you know, Barbara Beast, you know, various people, you know, it, it kind of all helped that I'd had this sort of background with, with people that were around the main characters because they kind of gave the atmos and the sort of um, the flavour of what mm. living in those times was like. And Steve, just picking just five stories to focus on can't have been all that easy given the, the, the wealth of material that you must have had. What was it about those that you did choose that, that really stood out for you? Mangrove had to be what, the first one. Mangrove was always the first one that had to be made because it was such an historical event. Um, nine people um, charged with a right and a fray for demonstrating uh, against police, police harassment on uh, a cafe uh, in Notting Hill, on All Saints Road. Um, you know, uh, uh, the old, uh, at the Old Bailey, um, uh, a court reserved for, you know, treason and murder and crimes against the state. So you could see the intimidation the government wanted to put down on these, on these people. So that had to be the first one because it was a mild... It was a milestone court case. Um, and then going from there to um, uh, um, Lover's Rock, for example, was that was an interesting one because, and again, it was always, I was always wanted to sort of, blues parties that I went to, of course, were much later. But it was about that kind of joy. It was about that kind of freedom. It was a sort of a blues parties where it was kind of church for young people. And I, I seriously do think that if there wasn't, wasn't these parties, because again, a lot of black people were not invited, were not welcome in, in the clubs and stuff like that. And, you know, so they had to cater for themselves. So the whole idea of clearing out your front room and making a party was very important. It was self, you know, it was, it was about self uh, um, elevation in a way and, 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 and doing it yourself. I do believe that if these parties didn't exist, there would have been a sort of deep psychosis of, of, of these young people because they needed a, 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 a place which was theirs, um, which wasn't their parents, which was theirs. And the music was part of that. Um, and then going on again, you know, we could talk about sort of um, uh, red, white, and blue, about the idea of black people from London and, and elsewhere in, 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 in the United Kingdom trying to sort of infiltrate the metropolitan police, trying to change it from the inside. You know, Leroy Logan, 
whose father, you know, again, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, you know, has a sort of incident with the police. This man is being trained to be a, a research scientist, but he, he changes his, his uh, ambition to go into the metropolitan police to change the sort of culture, which is very important uh, in, in, in a way of trying to sort of change it from the inside, not waiting for things to change, but actually, you know, going in and trying to change yourself. Again, one can talk about, again, after that, uh, uh, Alex Weedle and, and the last one, um, uh, education, which of course is sort of, kind of self-evident. Um, so it was very much about uh, an evolution, uh, with not just within time from 68 to 83 and such, but also in an evolution in people's understanding of who they are and um, you know, where they come from and, and where they want to go. So it was, mm. it's, I think it, was, it had to be, it had to be sort of, um, it had to be sort of found in a way, and that that was always where through the process. It was there, but sometimes you gotta, you gotta, you know, you gotta shape the the the, the marble. And um, and Helen Scott, I'd love to hear about the um, production design. What are your first thoughts when you get a call from Steve McQueen, who says he's making five different films set over several decades across different parts of London? <laughs> well, it's um, it. it yeah, it was amazing to meet Steve. I actually met I met Steve. He interviewed me, and um, it was just an exhilarating kind of meeting. I loved it, and I, it's really interesting to hear both Steve and Helen talk about the time spent, you know, in process getting this thing off the ground. Because when I when I came on board, it was you know straight straight in, and although I had a kind of you know sort of a knew the context of these these stories and this history I didn't know it deeply you know obviously I didn't know it deeply and I just um so I really had to hit the ground running and learn I learned so much I had to learn everything and I had to um also my job is to kind of find a sort of snapshot way of portraying it visually mm. um so that's that's that was the sort of journey I was on, you know, was to kind of t sort of take take um, just absorb as much as I could, could take it in, and sort of represent it back to Steve in in a in a visual way. My my sort of take on it, um, and yes, doing five films um, was was challenging because although there's a there is an umbrella to the whole series, you kind of want each story to have its own tone and it's all its own if they're all in their own time they are all separate stories but it has to be all of the same piece as well so um yeah it's kind of fast decision making fantastic working with steve because he's very um he's a great facilitator he's very positive he embraces what your ideas he embraces what you bring and sort of gives you permission really to fly um so yeah, it was a it was a wonderful experience. I was delighted that you know, I got the job. <laughs> and um and when you're recreating specific locations such as the um you know the the famed Mango Restaurant in Notting Hill, obviously it no longer exists. Yeah. But, but you know, just how authentic did you go with with the set and and what sort of research did you do to achieve this? Well, we we did stacks of research, and there is there is a lot out there, and um, we you have to dig dig quite deep to get it and there's actually quite a lot of visual reference and video reference but it we, we had to sort of piece it together and get a, a, um, a kind of you know version of the mangrove we had lots of clues and we spoke to people and we knew where it was originally where it sat in the street and you know what the other shops were around it we managed to get information on, on all of that so I think what we created was a sort of plausible version and had an authentic feel that wasn't, you know, strictly accurate. I think right. it had all the right sort of visual clues. Sure. We, and of course we <laughs> it, was, it, was ac it was accurate enough that some bloke walked on our set one day and he said, oh, this is like some place I used to live before. And it was like, <laughs> literally, it was like he walked back in time. So this gentleman who used to live in Labrador Grove in the, in the sort of uh, in the early 70s. Um, and he, he, he thought he didn't, he didn't know where he was. He thought he was walk back in time. So that's how good it was. Um, that was a great compliment. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, yeah. that's the best compliment you could possibly get. No, absolutely. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 
Um, and um, and Jacqueline, the, um, the the costume design, particularly on Lover's Rock, which is such a beautiful and joyous film, was just incredible. How much fun did you have immersing yourself into that world? And and again, what sort of research did you undertake to choose the the house party costumes? We did a lot of research, and there is a lot of photographic um, evidence. Um, a lot of there's lots available for the period that we're looking at. And so there, we, we spent a lot of time going through all sorts of different pictures. And, and I just remember specifically one meeting I had with Steve where I'd put together whole boards of looks. And in one corner, there was, there was some women in dresses that were of a different style to all the other pictures. And in fact, they were the, that style and finding those pictures was the hardest part. And Steve was looking at it and he said, yeah, oh look, that look. And then it, he said, oh, you know, that hasn't been done before. That is the look of the period. And it sums up so much about what, what was happening at those parties and how women wanted to present themselves at those parties. It was such a, a rich thing, a rich image and a rich look that um, it was decided then and there that was the direction we needed to go. The thing about the Lover's Rock look that we picked on is, is that it's distinct from like the wider sound system look and, and, the, and the look that we have seen interpreted again and again to varying degrees is much more of a general look, you know, that's familiar to the wider population. And this was so specific that it gave us something that was really special to, to base the party look around. What was interesting for me when we talking to you about it, Janet, was we discovered it looks very, it's very 30s. In yeah. its, in its look, very 30s. Very 30s yeah. in, in the dresses. And I remember my, my mother used to be, make patterns of, of dresses you know, for people, my aunt and stuff. But, but yeah, that was interesting. That kind of, that's so, so unique. So unique. And it was, it was very neat. And, and as someone who didn't know it firsthand, it would, be, it would never be something that I assumed was the was a style worn at parties, at blues parties, because it was something, it's so different to the style that is reinterpreted again and again. It was yeah. quite proper and quite aspirational and quite neat and quite ladylike and had all these great qualities that are normally not part of recreation. Do you think that's true, Helen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can see you know. it. Yeah, that's Absolutely. Because people used to come with their patterns. People yeah. used to come with their patterns and then they sing as sewing machines. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's why you don't really see it sort of uh, recreated. And I think what's that's so interesting also just about the sort of flow of the picture of you know because it all it, when you're when you're moving there's it, it, there's there's a, it, there's a dramatic flow, so it just accentuates your movement. And that's the thing that we got from Lovers Rock was the movement. Yeah. And of course, one of the other things which I love about Lovers Rock in the, in the sense as way. As well as, as as well as the setting of the of the um you know uh, set design, but also is the, is the shirts. You see yeah. the shirts and the, and how that is, and it's it's almost it's a, it's a, it's a multicolored. How can I say a collage of, of of movement and flow, and that's why for me it's very much like a, a fairy tale. And how everything comes together. It is a fairy tale. It is Cinderella. You know, everything happens at night. She goes to the ball in the morning. You know, you know the, 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 the horse is turning to mice. The pumpkin, the uh, carriage turns into a pumpkin. She's <laughs> You know, time for church, time for church. So, you know, it has this certain kind of uh, uh, beauty to it in some ways. And again, again, when you think of all those pictures, actually, those, when you think of all those Hot Disney pictures, you know, they're, they're, they're from the 30s, aren't they? They're, they are from the 30s. Yeah, pro, pro, post-war, yeah. And the dresses that we made, the two principal dresses mm. that we made were really 30s because they had that mm. sort of um, mm. shawl collar that's yes. so, totally lifted from the 30s. And the other thing yeah. that was a, about Lover's Rock was that it was the one story where you had freedom to invent and create a stylized world because it wasn't anybody's story. So mm -hmm. Alex Wheatle, the other episode that I was involved with was much more about tying in periods of time exactly to different moments in mm. Alex's life and trying to bring that sort of year by year reality, even though we had to compress time a lot. Lover's Rock was just, it was a sort of poetic statement, really, apart from anything else. It was a fairy tale, as Steve said. At one point, Steve, I think that you know, that, that was really what we were talking about, is, made, is a sort of magical quality. Yeah, well, love is, isn't it? 
Yeah. It was, it was if you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was very sensual as well, though. You know, the way the costumes reacted, you know, the way the costumes moved and the way the light caught them mm-hmm. made it very visceral and sensual as well. So it had that other element. It wasn't just a kind of, you know, it wasn't a dream. Yeah, it no. Was, it, it was very real. No, but parties are like really that. Good. Parties yeah. are... For me, you know, what I mean by that the dream or, or such or, or fairy tale or whatever, it's, you know, you, you look back at those things, it's always outside of everyday reality. It's not going to the shops, it's, it's, it's not going to work. It's you curate, a, you know, young people dressing up and going to and the music. It's real. It's not pretend. It is real. But it is it is other. And I think what's interesting about encapsulating that thing with Lovers Rock was this was a world that these people curated and it was a will a, a world which was about their their sort of wants and needs which was about to you know the whole idea of to sort of uh, I can say, to express themselves to be completely themselves mm-hmm. but at the same time this ca- is ca- this capsule which they've, they've, they've made is surrounded by alligators and sharks mm-hmm. which is the wider border unfortunate society that they find themselves in but they can make that place theirs mm-hmm. I um I spoke to your lead star in Lovers Rock, Amara J, uh, last year, and she said that when she went down for the table read, um, there were mood boards full of pictures and photos of you know Lovers Rock era parties and and musicians, and she actually saw her own dad in there because apparently he used to put on those parties himself. Did you find that there was a sense when you were making these films that you know a lot of the people you were working with were able to bring their own experiences and stories to the table? Well, again, it's like Scorsese and Italian Americans. You're dealing with West Indian sort of uh, uh, the children of West, you know, West Indians that, that came here. So there's a second hand. There's something which they can add. There's a certain kind of uh, je ne sais quoi which you couldn't sort of uh, sort of uh, give to people. They have to know. They, they they you give it to them and they take it further. So even with the food and uh, and, and and the language and how they hold themselves. I mean, what's so interesting about all of the all of all of the series? Um, of small acts is how people stand. Look at how they stand. Look at how they sit around the table and eat and, and, and their mannerisms, uh, you know, it, it's, it's second nature. And it's something which they never get, unfortunately, often don't get to express. So when they do, it's kind of joyous. When they do, it's kind of, um, you know, they can bring things from their grandmother. Maybe it's interesting because it was, I think it was Michael Ward was saying how he, how he was standing was very much how his dad was standing. He didn't actually notice it at the time, but as he looked back at the film, he thought, oh my God, that's my dad. Because he was in an environment which was very similar to how the, the, uh, that he saw as a child. Very interesting. Um, in his um, BAFTA acceptance speech, your cinematographer, Shabir Kirchner, said that he never thought a show like this would ever get made. Did you all feel like that you were working on something very different that hadn't been produced before? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> it hasn't, has it? <laughs> I mean, it hasn't, has it? So, yeah, obviously, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to talk for everyone, but everyone should have to, to, to say something about this. But for me, it, again, it was a must and a want and a need. And if I think if I, you know, I thought, hell, if I, I mean, oh, flip. If I, you know, if, if, if I don't do it, who will? But, you know, it's not up to, it wasn't, again, it wasn't a sort of, an, a, 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 a sort of um, a burden. It was an absolute privilege. So it was, it was uh, yeah, it was an absolute privilege to do and exciting and, uh, and uh, dangerous and all of those things. I, I appreciate you've probably asked this several times before, but given the amount of research and stories that you uncovered, any plans for a small axe round two? People stop me in the street and say, when's Small Axe 2 going to happen? All the time. <laughs> you know, and it's up to Steve, right? <laughs> well, I, I don't necessarily think we are the, sort of the guardians of anything sort of black and British and, and, and narrative. I mean, there's so many stories to tell. So many stories, so many, yeah. Uh, so, so, it's not a case of, hmm. so it's not a case of just putting it into a sort of a, some kind of a package. I mean, there should be, you know, lots of different ways that, that one could tell a story about black British people. European people, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I, I don't want to be typecast or, or packaged. This happens to be one a, a expression of that. I'm sure there'll be a thousand and one million more. Fantastic. Well, if this is this your uh, your one expression of it, it was, a, it was a fantastic one. Thank you so much, uh, Steve McQueen, Helen Bart, Jacqueline Duran, Helen Scott. And um, yeah, and thank you for joining us for the Hollywood Reporter Presents screening series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.